So the next stop on Harry's journey is the church. Remember, there's two churches in Silent Hill. There's the there's the outward facing exoteric church, and then there's the esoteric. There's like the dark church, you could say. So Harry finds himself in the church where he meets Dahlia Gillespie, where she reveals the Floros to him. The Floros' association with the Holy Trinity is quite obvious. In one sense, the Trinity is expressed in this scene. The Father, Harry, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, Dolly, are all in the same frame here. And this is kind of setting the stage for what is going to uh, occur through the game. So Dahlia positions herself as another helper along the hero's journey. We'll learn why she's not really a helper, but she's another type of character in, this, in the seven archetypal characters. She tells Harry that he must follow the path. The path Dolly refers to has a double meaning. The first meaning refers to the path that Dahlia is attempting to manipulate Harry through. She's trying to lead him through the path that she wants him to take. The second path is the hero's true path. As an individual, Dahlia is trying to control the outcome, but her expectations of control will ultimately dissolve, right? In the end, the sorcerer trying to control is typically not able to do so. Right, because intention. Intention matters. And if you have if your intention is is pure like Harry's is, there's nothing that will stop that. There's nothing that can overcome pure intention. And that's kind of the teaching in occult circles and also in Silent Hill. So she says <laughs> she says, You must follow the path, right? Follow the yellow brick road, as to say. So just like the Wizard of Oz. So the Floros is a triangle-shaped object. It's first introduced in a Christian church, just as the Holy Trinity would be. However, the Floros is akin to a very old concept in the occult. It was not invented by the Catholic Church. Floros is also the name of a demon associated with the triangle and fire, as we shall see at the end of the game. So there's, a, there's, there's definitely a double meaning here, but it's pretty significant. When she's holding up this triangle-shaped object in front of uh, Christ on the cross here. <laughs> she says it can break through the walls of darkness. She's telling him the truth. She's telling him something that's true, but she is trying to... She knows... So the thing is, we all know that Dahlia, she can't use this. Otherwise, she would just use it herself. She's giving it to Harry because... She's relying on Harry's intention to be pure, and it's the only way this Floros is gonna is gonna be able to take Alessa out of her spell, right? And we'll see how that works a little bit later. So let's talk about the Trinity. Knight, are you out of here, buddy? Good night, buddy. Thanks for stopping by, man. So many who believe in the Trinity are surprised, perhaps even shocked, to learn the idea of divine beings existing as trinities or triads long predates Christianity. Okay. I love these next slides. These are these are really interesting. So the trinity is not just for Christians. <laughs> as just as the symbols and archetypal characters appear in story after story through the ages, the same is true for the world's religions and many popular stories like the Matrix. You know the Matrix is actually a modern representation of the Trinity. Probably the most popular, right? I mean, heck, her name, Carrie Ann Moss, her name in the movie is actually Trinity. I mean, if that isn't if that's if that isn't a clue, <laughs> I don't know what is. Uh so of course Morpheus is the father, Trinity's the Holy Spirit or the mother, Neo is the son, right? Here is an image of the Trimurti. The Trimurti is the same thing, you guys. It's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And here's the Trinity expressed in Egypt. Osiris, the father. Isis, the mother. And Horus, the son. But what's the significance here? Well, and here it is, and here, it, here it is beautifully expressed. I found this gem of an article on the Trimurti. Um, fairly recently. So this is uh, the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. 
Okay. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hidden away in a secret chamber of the heart is the threefold flame. And keep in mind, the Trinity or the Trimurti, whatever you want to call it, it remember, every as above, so below. So just as it's expressed in the deities, it's expressed in the human spirit. Remember the Wizard of Oz? That's the Trinity, guys. Right? It's the Trinity. So stick with me on this. There's a few slides here. This gets really good. So hidden away in a secret chamber of the heart is the threefold flame, the divine spark of God placed in his sons and daughters. This flame has three petals, blue, yellow, and pink. The blue on your left, the yellow in the center, and the pink on your right correspond to the primary attributes of power, wisdom, and love. Respectively, these flames arise from a sphere of white light that is the flame of the mother. The flames of power, wisdom, and love, or faith, hope, and charity are the trinity within you. The power of Brahma, or the Father, the wisdom of the Son, Vishnu, Buddha, or Christ, and the love of Shiva, or the Holy Spirit, are all anchored in the threefold flame. The threefold flame within the human heart pulsates to liberate the divine blueprint of life into the body bodily form this flame one sixteenth of an inch in height is the divine spark the potential of your divinity it is the gift of life from the creator to the creation truly this threefold flame is the light which gives life to every man and woman born into the world now, this isn't some like religious stuff necessarily there's nothing that you need to believe here but you should pay attention as far as how these concepts keep being retold over and over around the world, right? That's kind of the point here. So the consciousness as the Son of God is centered in this flame, which is also called the Holy Vishnu Flame, the Atman, or the Holy Christ Flame. This flame is the individualization of the God Flame, whereby the world is within you, enabling you to behold the glory of God within your body temple. The flame that burns within your heart is the seed of cosmic consciousness. It is your link to reality, to being, and to life eternal. So at the end here, we can see, okay, this, this is the next slide I want to show you. So the Trinity around the world is expressed in different ways, sometimes religious, sometimes in pop culture. Okay, the Matrix, great example. Um, but at its core, however, it represents the threefold aspect of humanity. And you could say humanity or deity but the deities really are just the kind of the spirit within all of us right that's deeply understood in hinduism and many of the world's mystical traditions and religions so the three working together in harmony unite to become one undivided force for the enlightened so do you remember heart mind and courage it's the same thing guys heart mind and courage from the wizard of oz this is a very simple map of the trinity the sun father the holy spirit so if so basically what this means is if you're act so let's say you're at a job that sucks and you don't like it so you're thinking your thoughts down here this is your spiritual triangle for example and you're thinking god this job sucks and you feel like god i gotta get out of here but what are your actions doing are you leaving no well then you're within uh you're at dis-ease within yourself Right? That's where we get the word disease. Disease. You're at disease within yourself if your actions, emotions, and thoughts are not all in agreement. Right? So we can put on put on a good face and our action you know, we can we can think, Well, I don't want to be here. I don't like this person. And we can feel like we definitely don't like this person, but then we may put on a good face and say, you know, we go through the motions and we act like we like this person, but we're betraying ourselves inside. That's what the Trinity really is, right? So a Christ figure or somebody who's in alignment on all three, right? They're being completely genuine and they are in alignment in all three of these categories. And if you do that, then, um, yeah, you're like a Krishna, Christ-like figure or something, something like that. Pretty crazy stuff. Okay, so, so here's the next part, sacred plants and mystical visions. So Harry makes a brief visit to the police station where he learns of a drug derived from a plant native to the area. This is the, the white Claudia, right? 
I need to hang on just a second. I'll be right back. Okay. So Harry stops by the police station and he learns about this uh, white Claudia stuff, which is a plant indigenous to the region. So we're going to cover a little bit of, since Silent Hill talks a little bit about it, we're going to talk about some of the mystical traditions and psychedelics. You may, or, you may already know this. You may not. The use of sacred plants for mystical visions and healing has been part of world cultures for thousands of years. From the power-up mushroom in Mario Brothers to the shamanistic folklore origins of Santa Claus, sacred plants have a long history in human co-evolution. It's, no, um, it's no coincidence that Santa Claus, Santa Claus is dressed up like the Amanita muscaria mushroom here. Okay. Um, in we we get the we get the story of Santa Claus from Russia, and in Russia they used to they used to actually take these mushrooms and hang them on a pine tree, just as you see here, and they look like ornaments, right? Well, originally that that's why we hang ornaments on trees is because from that tradition they actually used to put these mushrooms, hang them from a tree indoors, so they would dry. So that's why they would bring a tree indoors, and they would hang them on the tree indoors. And by the way, these these Amanita muscaria grow underneath these uh, pine trees, typically. Um, I've actually picked them before, so I know quite a lot about them. So there's, you know the song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Well, reindeer love to eat these things because it gets them drunk. It gets them kind of a really euphoric feeling, and uh, it's no coincidence that there's a song about reindeer flying around and this guy dressed like a mushroom is flying around in the sky it's because he's a shaman and the gifts that he's bearing aren't physical gifts they're spiritual gifts they're spiritual insights he's offering uh, wisdom he's offering healing so Santa Claus originally in the original folklore was a shaman okay and now in pop culture it's been kind of in our modern so-called modern culture it's been turned into this story about gifts and it's been, you know, capitalism and all that kind of stuff. But really it's a healing tradition that comes to us from Asia and Russia. Here's a great little uh, image. <laughs> so why would the Catholic Church be so concerned about such off-the-wall theories as sacred mushrooms being used for religious practices in early Christianity? There is quite a lot of... Uh, proof of mushrooms being used in religious ceremonies and Christian ceremonies and all kinds of things. Surely Christianity wasn't built upon these far older traditions that used plants as healing. <laughs> Surely. I mean, look how these guys are dressed. They're, hmm. <laughs> then, then what does that make Krampus? I'm not familiar with Krampus. And I just wanted, this is a great little slide here. There's a Catholic priest who says, uh, who's quoted saying that mushroom rituals are part of a spirituality that can give great richness to the church and the world. So the church is in deep, the Catholic church is in deep denial about its shamanistic roots. It has its roots in far older traditions, just like, just like everything, right? Everything was built on something before it. And, you know, the, the Christian religions are no different. Part 10, alchemy and uniting of opposites. So this is, um, you, ever, you ever wondered why the hospital's called alchemia? You think there's some alchemy going on, <laughs> right? So this is Harry's next stop, Alchemy Hospital. Of course, the name is highly significant, right? It represents the underlying theme of this entire game. In order to understand just how significant the name is, we must ask what is alchemy. I'm sure some of you guys probably know a lot about this already. So the alchemical opus is a quote by Carl Jung, remember the um, godfather of psychology. The, alchem the alchemical operations were real, only this reality was not physical but psychological. So there's two understandings of alchemy. The exoteric alchemy or the pop culture alchemy is transmuting the lesser substance of lead 
into the higher substance of gold. So that's kind of the outward facing um, Hollywood version of alchemy. But the alchemy in Silent Hill is actually esoteric alchemy. And that's the real alchemy anyway. That's transmuting the lesser self or base nature into the higher self. And this is actually what's happening to Harry, Harry Mason, as he goes through the game here and he goes through each stage. He's actually leveling up. He's going through each of the seven steps of alchemy. It's kind of crazy. Let's talk about individuation. This is a step of alchemy. So described by Carl Jung as the process of synthesis of the self, which consists mainly of the union of the unconscious and the conscious. Remember the sun and moon, right? As above, so below. Well, it's the same correlation. The unconscious and the conscious. Harry must find a way on his journey to have a synthesis or bring in alignment, bring in agreement so that the unconscious and the conscious are actually talking to each other, right? I love this quote by Jung. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. So the only way to do this kind of alchemy, Harry must go into the deepest, darkest unconscious. It's the only way out of here for him. It's the only way that he can level up. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will control your life and you'll call it fate. This is how most people live their lives. <laughs> they live their lives, they're that little tiny bit above the water and they think that's their reality. But most of who they are, their motivations and their understandings lie beneath the surface and they're not bringing them up into the light so that they can inspect them and understand them. This is how most people are right here. Most people are icebergs and they're just kind of, uh, they're just kind of uh, unconsciously they're being directed every which way and they don't understand it consciously. They don't understand why. So that's what that little quote's about. So alchemy in physical and metaphysical senses means transmuting a base substance to something greater. So the alchemy of Silent Hill is metaphysical, of course. This is an image of Hermes thrice times great. Hermestus Trimysticus, I believe. I could be mispronouncing that. You can see the sun here at the top and the moon at the bottom. Of course, the sun is the conscious. The moon, the feminine, right, is the unconscious. And, and this, is a, this is a synthesis between the two. And, he's, and if you can see, Hermes is pointing at the unconscious. So he's he's giving he's showing what's more important. Right? It's the unconscious. Right? It's like listen to that because that's actually driving your decisions, that's driving your understanding. The unconscious is in a million times smarter and more in tune with that, with reality than your conscious mind, than your waking mind. Human beings assimilate reality in four distinct ways. And this, I found this at random on the internet while I was researching this project. I just wanted to put this in here because this, this incorporates some steps of alchemy quite well. So think about in our personal lives, you know, the first stage is denial. You think, oh, everyone else is the problem, right? And then projection. So you're putting your own stuff on other people, right? Or you, you have, there's this thing called cognitive bias where you assume people think the same way you do, right? And then you get upset when they don't respond the way you would respond, right? That's projection. Integration is the next step where you start to, uh, you're no longer projecting onto other people, your expectation or how you think they should be or how you think they should think and being let down constantly. <laughs> but instead, you're integrating your experience. So you're actually... You're no longer projecting, but you're taking 
um, other points of view, you're taking other parts, you're observing people more closely, you're observing yourself more closely, and you're not only just understanding, but you're making you're making everything part of your behavior. You're like integrating it, right? Integration is much much more than knowledge. It's actually practicing these things. It's it's, it's actually doing things unconsciously without realizing you're doing it, right? That's a really high level to be at. And of course, transmutation is trans meaning to um, follow through or to travel. And then mutation means, of course, to change. So you're actually changing. So through that integration, you actually change. And there's, some al there's a lot of alchemy in here in Silent Hill. What does the word alchemy even mean? It actually comes from the word which describes the land of Kemet, which is Egypt. So Alchemet, alchem it's where we get the word alchemy. Alchemet translates to out of darkness. It's what the Greeks used um, originally, alchemet. And we saw this a little bit earlier in the elemental uh, forces here and how they correlate to human beings. But I wanted to touch on this again. Just remember that we've got the feminine symbol of earth and water, the triangle facing downward, fire and air, upward. Right, and of course the spirit, which is the unification of all of these things. So in the hermetic tradition of alchemy, and remember this is the Western understanding. We live in the West, we're Western thinkers, um, so that's how we see the world. The Eastern way to think is completely different. The ancient way to think, where this alchemy originated from Egypt, completely different way to think. They don't think the same way we do. And we can't begin to understand them just by the Western point of view alone. It's it's not going to work. This is this is written at the Oracle at Delphi, and this is alchemy, and this is what Silent Hill is going to show us. So heed these words, you who wish to probe the depths of nature. If you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. No truer statement has ever been inscribed anywhere, in my opinion. Part 11, the shadow self. This is where Harry's going deep. <laughs> He's going deep. And who does he meet for the first time? Dr. Kaufman. So the first thing that happens when he meets Dr. Kaufman is the doctor immediately shoots at him. The doctor is a representation of Harry Mason's shadow self, his deepest unconscious fears. This image is very telling. Harry cowers and tells the doctor, I'm not here to fight. So consciously, Harry knows that he, he, he has it together consciously, but unconsciously there's some turmoil here, right? His unconscious shadow will keep bringing up his greatest sorrows throughout their conversation. And um, Dr. Kaufman's a very, obviously, a deeply disturbed and negative character, right? And Dr. Kaufman has a hidden agenda. And, uh, of course, Dr. Kaufman will only be led into the light kicking and screaming. Harry re remains very calm throughout this entire interaction, despite Dr. Kaufman's probing despite all of the negative things dr kaufman brings up or brings out of harry harry still remains calm right so harry's actually he is doing the alchemy here in a sense he's actually face to face with his shadow self and he's inspecting it right so i mean we can take these characters literally but metaphorically in the spiritual sense in the meta sense there's a lot going on here guys so Dr. Kaufman says the creatures they have both seen are aberrations that don't really exist. So that's even a clue. Kaufman knows this because he represents the unconscious. So of course he knows this. He knows they're not true, but still he has fear, right? He has, he has deep-seated fears. And Harry, of course, agrees. So we all know these are projections. So there's more than meets the eye here. So who is Dr. Kaufman? Maybe we can psychoanalyze him for a minute. So Kaufman means merchant. And it just so happens that the good doctor is selling drugs on the side. 
So it seems to, he seems to have sold his soul as well, right? Given his duplicitous nature, the doctor is at odds within himself. Remember the whole Trinity thing? Thoughts, emotions, actions? He's not living that. <laughs> the doctor, on the one hand, he cares for the sick. And on the other hand, he distributes street drugs and looks the other way regarding Alessa's abuse. So he's a very troubled, deeply troubled character of the unconscious mind that Harry has to contend with. So as Harry proceeds through Alchemy Hospital, he must collect four plates. You guys remember this? A reference to Alice in Wonderland, of course. The cat, the queen, the mock turtle, and the hatter plates. Remember, the concept of personal growth or alchemy is still at play here in a big way. Here's part 12, Alice in Wonderland. Just like Harry Mason in the story of Alice in Wonderland, Alice finds herself on a journey for her identity and personal growth, both figuratively and literally. She is searching for some understanding of the strange world around her and within herself. So is Harry and so are we all. <laughs> That's why these stories have so much relevance to us. Okay, we're going to talk about all of the four plates, each character on the plates here. So the Cheshire Cat appears out of thin air and offers Alice advice, albeit steeped in metaphor. Of the four plates or forces, the Cheshire Cat is the symbol of air. Air is associated with the intellect and the masculine energy aspect. The Cheshire Cat is speaking in metaphor. Metaphor is also intuitive, creative, so there is some feminine element to this character. Lewis Carroll did this very intentionally, by the way. You'll see, yeah, every, you'll see every character is actually has this um, interesting mix. The Mock Turtle is described as a melancholy character, and he's depicted as crying in this original illustration. Of the four plates or forces, remember the four elemental forces, the Mock Turtle represents the symbol of water. Water is associated with the intuition and the feminine energy aspect. Yet he's a male, but he's still water. Lewis Carroll described the Queen of Hearts as a blind fury, aggressive and quick to anger. The association for the Red Queen is rather obvious. Of the four plates or forces, the Queen of Hearts represents the symbol of fire. The Red Queen represents aggression, not passion. She's associated with the masculine energy aspect. It's a very masculine trait, although she's a woman, right? So you can see this interplay. And finally, the Hatter. So in the original depiction of the Hatter, he this is in the original story, uh, in the original book, he's seen with a tea and a biscuit. He is the most relatable or down-to-earth character of the four. Notice he is not wearing shoes, an indication of just how grounded he really is. Of the four plates or forces, the Hatter represents the symbol for the earth. Earth is associated with benevolence, empathy, and the feminine energy aspect, and yet he's also a male character. It's interesting, right? Lewis Carroll demonstrated this interplay, and this actually shows up in Silent Hill. So Harry's first lesson at Midwich was more about the very basic yin and yang, male, female. Now at Alchemia, right, it's being demonstrated through these plates that there's nuances. There's the, there's the feminine mixed in with the masculine there's the masculine f mixed in with the feminine in these characters and they're all like this so there's these really nuance there's these nuances happening right there's these um really fundamental it's not as it's not as clear cut as it was in the beginning right things are getting a little more complex and we'll see things get even more complex as harry uh, progresses through the story so there's this balanced disharmony that Carol obviously put into these characters. Each character is dynamically uh, overlapping into the next and represents the complex amalgam of traits found within Alice herself. And of course, why would you put Alice in Wonderland plates in Silent Hill? It's just the same reason you'd want to put something like The Wizard of Oz. These are all occult stories, right? Wizard of Oz is a deeply theos the theosophical um, you could say mystical, religious story, 
Same thing with Alice in Wonderland. And of course, the mushroom symbolism in Alice in Wonderland is pretty obvious. Part 13, Down the Unconscious Rabbit Hole. Just as we saw at Midwich Elementary, Harry finds himself in the other world of Alchemy Hospital. This time he's going deeper into the unknown or the unconscious. And he even says, I don't have a map for this place. <laughs> you know you're going deep, son. So just as before at Midwich, the image of Alessa is revealed as Harry travels further into the unknown darkness of the other world. We are deep in the unconscious of Alessa at this point. After leaving the room that Alessa was in, Harry enters the examination room where he meets Lisa Garland. Lisa is derived from the German and it means devoted to God. A garland, of course, is a wreath of flowers and leaves. A garland is symbolic of earth and peace. The purity and divine feminine energy Lisa represents is quite obvious here. Lisa says she is forbidden to go into the basement. She asks Harry what is down there. Just as Harry is about to explain what he found down there, his head takes on an overwhelming sensation as he falls to the floor. <laughs> 